Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where myself and Alex aim to answer as many of your bike and tech related questions as possible within the allotted time. As ever, you can submit your questions down in the comment section below using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Let's right. get to it. Who's our first, first question? question. B.Stavney8317 says, why is the watt meter always in the cranks or pedals? Could a piezoelectric sensor not go in the sole of the shoe or the cleats as an alternative? Well, there are actually running power meters that some people have developed. Wow. That for, for runners that are yeah. built into shoes. But most power meters are based around strain gauge sort of technology yeah. and stuff. But I think the main downside of this is, is like, your shoe wears and like cleat as cleats well. Cleats yeah. wear. They're like a consumable part. So putting some expensive piece of like power measuring tech doesn't make much sense. Plus, it's a lot more difficult to measure power even at the pedals. So it's going to be way more difficult to measure power going through the shoe. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot more variables. Whereas like when you have power at the hub or on the crank, it's just a more consistent, more accurate place to try and measure power. Perfect. Total agreement with you there, mm. thanks. Um, Christoph Nivel Notter, 9361. How do you care for the derailleur after cleaning? Do the joints need to be oiled or waxed? Not specifically. I've got to be honest and say I've never washed my bike and then oiled the individual pivots in the rear derailleur. I think however they're installed at factory it tends to last for a very long time. Mm. Hmm. Although something you should be aware of is the big kind of articulation uh, joint in a rear derailleur and there's also the big uh, spring in there. For the pulley cage. Yeah, often yeah. has like a lot of thick kind of packing grease in. Yeah. And it is possible if you use like really strong degreaser to just wash all of that out. Yeah. And you want to try and avoid doing that. So if you do end up stripping your rear derailleur dry because you've degreased it really harshly um yeah it was, it's actually a pretty yeah. simple job to do that yeah um same process as replacing it with like an oversized pulley wheel it's actually 10 15 minute job cool yeah. uh, next question is from michael arnold 1150 who says what are your thoughts on bike wrap protection for bikes are is it worth it or just extra weight to protect the paint so there's two well, there's two things here yeah so th there's um, like putting 3M paint protection film on bikes. Like on the down tube? Yeah, or like in key areas to stop cable rub on your chain stays on a down tube, like say to stop rock strikes and stuff. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, and yeah. it's cheap. You can you can pick it up um, various places for not, for not much money. Mm -hmm. The other thing though, when he says um, bike wrap, is what we're starting to see now is something which has come from cars which is uh, vinyl wraps. Yeah. So automotive, when you see that really, really naff looking matte black BMW that with the, you know, offensive exhaust, like bombing down the street. I feel like someone, this, this situation has become personal to you. Um, yeah, like really, that's a vinyl wrap. That yeah. car isn't that color. It's not been resprayed. It, they've put a vinyl wrap on because they think it looks really cool. It doesn't, it looks pants. Now, there are vinyl wraps you can put on supercars and the people put them on their cars and it is a cool, like it can look really tasteful and good. And they've started to do this on bikes now. Yeah. There are a few people offering vinyl wrap services for bikes. So it's a, a much a more cost effective way to give your bike a funky paint job yeah, rather than I'm an with, actual yeah. respray. The downside is that it's, it's adding like you say, it's adding weight. Significant amount of weight. Yeah, right? so you're probably gonna like add on, you know, a couple of hundred grams of yeah. weight of wrap. Yeah. So if but you're not bothered I, about that, fine. But in like, fairness, it is gonna protect the paint work though. Yeah, you're adding a layer of film yeah. over the top, so it's, yeah. I personally wouldn't go for an entire wrap on a frame. I would just put tape or protective wrap in key certain areas to protect the paint that in the areas that it needs it. Mm. Yeah. Um, Matt Marcus. Will GCN ever cover belt-driven bikes, their performance capabilities, and against train-driven counterparts? Um, God, loads of stuff in this question here, but are the subject of belt-drive bikes? Mm. Not actually something we've massively covered before, but... We have, we have like, I mean, I can think of... Like, a few examples. Yeah, like where we've gone to, you know, uh, yeah. like bike shows, like Eurobike and stuff, where we've shown belt-drive stuff. We have done some content specifically on Gates Carbon Drive before yeah. in the past. And, you know, we've seen them, covered them at like Red Hook crit races and stuff. I mean, I agree, they are cool, but 
the overall thing with carbon with um like the gates carbon drive is it has advantages and disadvantages yeah so low maintenance and and all the rest of it and like really hard wearing and stuff like amazing for urban bikes oh fantastic like amazing commuting, for like commuting like absolutely superb but for pure performance not as efficient as a chain yeah and so you're not going to want to race on it you're not going to want to you know go do like big events on it if, if you're trying to go as fast as you can so you know diff, diff, also if different you run strokes a, for different boats also if you run a belt drive you've you're forced to run either internal hub gears or a gearbox at the crank again yeah. two different systems which tend to be inefficient. less mechanically efficient yeah so if you're after mechanical efficiency um which some people are you don't go for a belt drive if you're after longevity ease of maintenance and and just like anything for an easy life um carbon drive like you know, yeah. belt drive belt great drive solution. is something i'd like to have a look at more in the future though so yeah. keep your eyes peeled because i'd quite like to investigate it more um the, the Haitian, Haitian says can anyone tell me the pros and cons of carbon fiber rim brake wheels i'm thinking of making the switch but would like to know more about them well Hmm. The pros and cons. Well, downside, carbon rim brake wheels, not great for dissipating heat on long descents. No. Um, advantage of carbon fiber rim brake wheels, lighter than aluminium versions, and you can have lots of different shapes that aren't achieved with aluminium. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hmm, yeah, I'm not, like carbon clinches is the key yeah. thing, like carbon clinches on, ri on rim brakes, not a fan. You know, okay. Not Fair a fan. Dues. Because I just think, yeah, there's a good chance if you're, especially if you're a bigger rider, or you're just going down, if, if you're a normal sized rider, but you're going down like really, really steep roads where you're having to drag the brakes and brake hard, there's a serious risk of delamination. Yeah. Like, it's a fact. When I visited um, Rob at Carbon Bike Repair, he was quite against carbon fiber rim brake wheels with a carbon braking surface, but the technology has been around for quite a while, and with minimal failures, I think. But it's one of the main yeah. reasons. Well, I think there's yeah a lot of failures. It's the, one of the best advantages of disc brakes. Yeah, hundred like, percent. Is that that you don't? So yeah, and carbon fiber rim brake technology not really being developed and progressed any further by manufacturers now. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, Joshua Dam How six six seven says, why do pro riders hide their power and heart rate data on Strava? I've heard it so rivals can't try to emulate their numbers, but surely everyone is doing all they can to produce the best numbers. So why don't the pros just give people what they want and show us the data? I think there's a few reasons for it. Okay. You don't want to know what your you don't want to give any like advantage to the to the rivals. So one of the things would be if, if it looked like you were doing, even though it's taken out of context and it's not a racing environment and it's not yeah. as, like or whatever, like you you don't want to give any advantage. So an advantage could just be a psychological one. Yeah. It could just be like seeing someone on their limit, maybe in a, even if it was a summit finish in a race or like yeah. whatever, what, one of your rivals watching that back and going, oh, well, they were only doing that. You go, well, I know I can do like five watts more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Which then gives you the psychological edge. And, and often the, the, the difference between winning and losing at the top end of the sport is who's mentally stronger. Yeah. And so having that edge could be massive. The other thing is, is you, you can analyze the training a lot more. So rival coaches and stuff can break down, they can see what training sessions someone's doing, they can maybe see how effective it is, they could log it all, they could, they could get a lot from this, they could really go into detail. So, you know, knowledge is power. I don't, don't give it away for free. Yeah, that's true, I don't give it away for free, but I can see the, the argument against this saying, well, Everyone's trying to train as hard as they possibly can. So really, you're not going to go, oh, well, if an art can do an extra 10 watts, oh, I better train some more. I think, I don't think it's going to drastically change it, but no. I get the reason behind keeping it top secret. You might, yeah. it, it's not It's not difficult to hide that stat, those no. stats. Might as well. So you might as well. Yeah. It's basically it, really. Okay, last question from this week's Tech Clinic. You hit it, Ollie. Um, it's from Inglossy63, <laughs> which might be I'm glossy. Yeah, it might be. Uh, my question would be, for someone who splits time indoors and outdoors, any difference in shoes? Same bike, same pedals used for both. Cheaper shoes indoors. Um, well, the, the only difference I make is in the current horrific weather that we've been experiencing yeah. so far all year in the UK, yeah. is I would wear like my newer, cleaner shoes 
indoors yeah. and keep them clean and wear like an older pair outdoors where they get dirty all the time. Well, that is the luxury that you've got if you've got two pairs of shoes, but I'm gonna find out you don't need to have different shoes for riding indoors, different shoes for outdoors. Um, it's not vastly gonna change the characteristics that you get from the shoe, the performance, plus, it's probably just easier to have one set of cleats, one set of shoes set up. You know that they get on, you get on with them, they fit like a glove, and it's job done. I yeah. don't think you need to like double your costs just for having separate shoes. No. There's, there, I mean, there are companies now that make indoor specific cycling shoes. Yeah. Like some of the fitness brands like Nike or whatever. Yeah, Nike I think they're aimed at like. like spinning gym, market. Yeah, gym classes, yeah, that like, kind of thing. Absolutely not, not essential. Like, I, yeah would use the standard shoes you use outdoors, yeah. indoors all the time. Easy. Right, I'm glad we cleared that up. That was the last question of this week's Tech Clinic. Hope we've answered all your questions. If we haven't, as always, keep putting them in the comments section down below and we'll get to them in the coming weeks. Should we call it a day? See you next week? Yeah. Right, see you later. Bye.